Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, this morning, we're going to turn to a passage in 1 Corinthians. We're carrying on our sermon series, uh, Spirit Filled. We've been looking at the fruit and the gifts of the Holy Spirit this last few weeks, as we all know. And really, the point behind the whole thing, I suppose, for, for me touching this is a, a number of things. But one of the things is that we need in the church people of character which is the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, and so on. We need uh, men and women who are Christ-like and have a Christ-like character. We also need power. We also need the Holy Spirit to come and use us and empower us with his gifts. So if we're going to do much for God, we need both of these things. And we can't have one to the exclusion of the other. We can't be people all about holiness and forgetting about the gifts of the Spirit and the power of God. And we can't be people who are running after the gifts without a keen desire to become more like Christ and to be holy. So we need to hold both these things together and we need to have them both operating and at work within us. So this morning, every time I turn to this passage, there's instant conviction and there's constant direction in equal measure. You can't read this passage that we're about to read and not be challenged. You can't read it and sit there unaffected. You're going to be convicted. Let me just uh, warn you at the outset. That's where it's going to go. It's just such a, a deep and challenging portion of scripture. It's a famous chapter. It's a beautiful chapter. It's challenging. But more importantly than all of that, it is an essential portion of scripture it's an essential chapter to have and to understand because what it will do when you properly understand it it's going to save you from running your entire christian life in vain from 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 going through the motions for nothing really is what the text says you could be a christian you could uh, be going to church and at the end of the whole thing it's nothing if you don't get your hands on this truth it's massively important. Let's open, please, 1 Corinthians 13 and read the extremely beautiful and extremely challenging words of the Holy Spirit here through Paul. The title over, uh, over the chapter in my Bible, the ESV, is The Way of Love. Okay, but I want to back up a bit. I want to, uh, because the chapters are divided and they're not inspired divisions, I believe just to help us to come through is to come to chapter 12 and verse 31. We'll begin reading there and we'll carry through 13. It says this, But earnestly desire the higher gifts, and I will show you a still more excellent way. Here is the more excellent way of what the Corinthians were up to. They were into the gifts. They were full of gifts. They, had, they lacked no gift as they waited for the return of the Lord. But here's one thing they lacked. And I'm going to show you a still more excellent way, says Paul. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I'm a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all I have, And if I deliver up my body to be burned, but have not love, I gain nothing. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It's not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends, never falls. It's never defeated. As for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I gave up childish ways. For now, we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now, I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. So now, faith, hope, and love abide, these three. But the greatest of these 
is love. Pursue love. And I earnestly desire the spiritual gifts, especially that you may prophesy. And we'll leave it there this morning. Let me just point out a few things about this chapter, about what it is and what it isn't. Uh, firstly, it isn't, um, just let me get my notes here, because I'm a slave to notes. Uh, this is not Paul teaching the church that uh, the pursuit of love is to replace the pursuit of spiritual gifts. So what some people will get their hands in this chapter and they'll go, ha ha, here's what Paul's doing. They'll say, uh, uh, this is Paul telling us to concentrate in love and forget about all those other strange things that goes on in the church. But that's not what's happening. It's not Paul teaching the church, just concentrate in love and forget about the gifts. It's not a condemnation of the gifts by any means. If you read it like that, you're reading it wrong. That's not what he's saying. Uh, why I say this is because if you, read, uh, if you read it like this, you're reading it wrongly. And to try to use that chapter to say that is just a mistake. You could be tempted to say, well, as a church, we value love. It sounds noble, but it's not what he's saying here. We value love more than the gifts. Uh, after all, this chapter is all about the more excellent way, isn't it? And the more excellent way is all about love. So we'd rather concentrate in love and to the exclusion of the gifts. But to think like that is really to misunderstand the text. That's why I read the bits on the, on the top and the bottom. And when you set the chapter into the whole discussion of chapter 12 to 14, he's not telling us to pursue love and forget about gifts. Did you get that? Paul is arguing here that the gifts must function in the context of love. That the gifts must be used motivated by love. That don't use the gifts without love. But he's not saying pursue love and forget about the gifts, as some people would maybe try to slant it like that. Did you get that? Paul is arguing how your gifts and your works in the church must be motivated by love. Lived and, and used through a life of love. So love, I'm saying what it isn't. Love doesn't replace spiritual gifts. It's more like this. Love is the essential ingredient for the safe and fruitful use and operation of the gifts. Because knowledge and gifting in isolation and gifts in isolation just makes people puffed up and destroys and breaks down. But love, says Paul, builds up and it's profitable and it brings us somewhere. So let's not allow this chapter to confuse us and to be used to explain away the clear command there of 14 and 1. Pursue love and eagerly desire the spiritual gifts. It's both. Another thing that this chapter is not doing before we move into look at the text, <clears throat> it's not teaching us that love is a spiritual gift either. It's not saying that love is another one of the gifts and some people have it and some people don't. It's not teaching that. Spiritual gifts are distributed by the Holy Spirit as he sovereignly wills. So uh, not everyone gets all the gifts and, and, and the Holy Spirit says you'll get this but you'll not get that. And maybe you'll get this gift, but you won't get that gift. And he apportions to whom he will, says the text. So the Spirit is sovereign over giving the gifts. And some may have a particular gift and others not. Love isn't like that. Love is not a spiritual gift. Uh, love here is a way of life. And it's, and it's for you. And the Holy Spirit wants to work this fruit of the Spirit into your life. It's not like some people are, have really got this gift of love and I don't. No, God wants us all to be living a life of love. He tells us uh, love is a way of life. He says we're commanded to love. We're to chase after it. Pursue it. That's what it means. You're, we're to be hunting after love. Because in ourselves, love's hard to get our hands on. That's why we have to pursue it. It's hard to get to the place of love. He says, run after it. He says, pursue it diligently. But he says it's for you. So he does. We cannot be commanded to have any particular gift, but we, Scripture over and over again, it commands us. It says, love one another. It says, pursue love. It says, you must be rooted and grounded in love. It says, walk in love. It says, let all that you do be done in love. That, that everything you do is to be done in love. That's what the scripture says. So love isn't a spiritual gift. It's an essential fruit of the spirit. We're commanded to walk in it as a way of life. This is why it's important. Now I want <clears throat> to walk through the chapter in three chunks. 
uh, over the next two weeks. We're not going to do it all this morning. Uh, I just found that as we came to the last point, I wanted just to, to take that aside and deal with that next week and really concentrate on the first two points that I want to make. Verses 1 to 3 teach us about the essential need for love. Verses 4 to 7 teach us about the essential characteristics of love, what it is. And verses 8 to 13 next week teach us about the eternal permanence of love. It abides forever when the gifts will pass away. And we're going to discuss that in a few, in, uh, next week. Firstly, let's get our Bibles open and look into the first three verses. The essential need for love. How essential love is. Before we get on to the definition of what it is. He says there... <coughs> I want to read it again. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I'm a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, like you're, you're a man of faith, if, you can, if you're seeing that type of an effect, if you're seeing miracles happen as a result of your prayers, but if you've not got love, I am nothing. If I give away all that I have, and if I uh, deliver up my body to be burned, but have not love, I gain nothing. That's what he's saying there. So if the Apostle James taught us that faith without works is useless, well, Paul here is teaching us that works without love is useless. James tells us faith without works is useless, is bogus. And, and Paul is clearly telling us here uh, to, the, to the brow of our nose, really. Scripture doesn't uh, hide anything from us. He says works without love is useless. No good. Don't, don't go there. The one who would move in the gifts and move in, in, a, in this Christian life had better be moving in love. That's, that's the point. I mean, <clears throat> these three verses are very straightforward and we ignore them at our peril. We can't miss the point. We don't need to be a rocket scientist to get it. He's just banged it home time and time again. And there's no great interpretation needed. He just says, you're nothing. It's no good. It's useless. So... <clears throat> it doesn't matter what gift you have, if you've all the gifts to the highest degree. That's, that's the type of language he's, he's, he's stressing. He's going, even if you had all the gifts to the highest level, to the greatest anointing in all your giftings, and yet every one that the Holy Spirit could throw at you, and you don't have love, no good. It's over. You lack everything. You gain nothing. You're wasting your life. You're wasting your time. You're not what you think. Because you could be deceived. You could be thinking, God's using me. I'm, I'm being blessed. I'm anointed. I've got the faith that can see things happen. I'm a man of prayer. What's motivating your Christian life? What's underneath driving you to do what you do? Because the heart's deceitful above all things. And what can happen, and, and we're, especially, we're especially apt to be deceived in the area of religion and God. Because what can happen is you can start to move and operate to get men's applause instead of God's praise. You can move and operate out of a bad motive instead of the foundation motive that Paul says is love. Verse 1, look at it. Speak in every tongue available, human or angel. And if you lack love, he says you're empty, you're making empty, useless noise is what the point is there. Empty, clanging symbols. Verse 2. He says, you may have the spiritual gift of prophecy to such a level that you understand all mysteries and all knowledge. You may have such a gift of faith that miracles happen when you pray. You can move mountains in faith. But if you don't have love, says Paul, you're not great. You're seeing great things happen, but you yourself are, he says, you're nothing in the eyes of God and the Holy Spirit. You may do great things, but without love, motivating your actions. It's no point. It's useless. Verse 3, and then we continue to look at this verse. You might do, <clears throat> he shifts slightly from the gifts there, but really maybe it's a gift of giving he's talking about here, a spiritual gift of giving. He's really going through some of the spiritual gifts, if you just notice that in passing. He's talking about speaking in tongues, gift of tongues. He's talking about prophetic power, prophecy, understanding all mysteries, wisdom and knowledge. He's talking about a gift of faith that could move mountains and see miracles happen. He's going through, he's, he's isolating some of the gifts. And maybe here he's talking about, if you've got a gift of giving to the point where you're doing such personal sacrifice that could hardly be imagined, I mean, you're selling everything you own to buy food for the poor and the hungry. Uh, or if you're giving your body 
to, as a martyr to the flames to be burned for Christ. But he says, if you do these things, the point is, from an improper motive, you gain precisely nothing. This is important. I need to, I need to take this out and, and preach it. You know, you could talk about being on fire for Christ. Here's a martyr being burned. But if you're on fire for Christ, and if you're, fi- and if you're full of zeal for Christ, but if it's for any other reason than for love, it's a waste of fuel. I mean, we should be on fire for Christ. You shouldn't be lukewarm. I mean, this guy gives his body to be burned, but he doesn't do it out of love. There's something else maybe motivating it. Maybe it's a bit of hyperbole involved too. It's a bit of a, Paul's bringing it up to the highest level, exaggerating it out so we can get the point. Okay, but we need to get the point. The verses teach us the essential need for love. That's the first point. Paul's lesson to the Corinthians stands good in Castle Derg 2,000 years later. Nothing's changed. The Bible's good. The Bible's good teaching this morning as it was when he preached it. Make sure that whatever we're up to in Castle Derg, whatever your life, uh, whatever you're seeing done in your life, whatever you're doing in your life for, for Jesus and for the Lord, make sure it's motivated and backed up by a life of love. Otherwise, you run the race in vain. Otherwise, all your sacrifice, all your service and worship, all your spiritual efforts, all your praying, all your turning up to church, all your giving, that last portion there, all your giving, there's no reward at the end of it awaiting you. It has to be love. God isn't impressed by mere action or shows of display done to increase our own reputation or to boost our self-esteem. Maybe we come to church because we want to get a little kick. It makes us feel better, but it must be out of love for God. We want to come and worship Jesus and love for other people. That we want to see him use us in our own lives, in our own families, in our own workplace, and in our own town. That it's not a selfish walk that you're walking for me. I come to church because I get helped or I get this. It's good to do those things and God will help you. But underneath the whole thing, it must be undergirded and underpinned by love primary. God rewards and recognizes the man or woman's efforts done out of love. And God searches our hearts and he examines our motives and he tests our deeds and actions. And when it comes to serving him, God, when it comes to analyzing our service of him, I want to put it like this, God is massively motive-minded. Like he can see right through what's going on. So let's ask ourselves this morning, this is point one, the essential need for love. Do we have that essential ingredient at all? Are we aware of the need for it? And do we have it? We need to pray if we've been walking aimlessly, if we've been just going through the motions with Jesus. and We need love. That'll fuel your life. That'll keep you going. Are all our efforts, in fact, amounting to anything or nothing? It really is that serious. It really is. Secondly, we're going to move on into the next bit of the text. Paul teaches there about the essential need for love. And then Paul teaches in verses 4 to 7 the essential characteristics of love. What is it? How do you define it? What's God asking of us? Uh, this, let's read verses 4 to 7 anyway. Let's go through it again. Verse 4, <clears throat> the essential characteristics of it. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. So this is why it's challenging. I warned you at the outset, you're going to be convicted. I mean, if you can read that and not feel the Holy Spirit moving and challenging you, there's something wrong. Because this... As a supernatural love. This is not something that we, it just appears in the human heart without God getting involved. This is something that we need God to move in us and through us to accomplish. We're not capable of, of, making, of ringing the bell on these texts. We're not capable of it without God coming into our life and helping us along. God who is love. God is love. And he can come and he can change our hearts. So this love is basically a description of everything the Corinthians weren't. 
Uh, if you go through the letter, you'll read that everything that he's saying about love, that there's something in the letter where they fell down on this characteristic. Uh, love is patient and kind. The Corinthians were not patient and kind. They were going ahead at the Lord's table. They were getting drunk. They weren't bothered about the people who were poor in the church or waiting for them. Uh, love does not envy or boast. The Corinthians were full of envy and boasting. They were setting themselves up about uh, one man is better than another man. I'm of Paul. I'm of Apollos. I'm of Peter. I'm of Christ. And they were fighting about who was the best man to listen to, maybe. And they were causing division in the church by being fleshly in their approach to Bible teaching. They were causing division due to boasting and arrogance, which is not love. Uh, Love keeps no record of wrongs doesn't rejoice in wrongdoing. These believers were taking each other to court. Paul pulls them out and he says, you're already failing in this area. You're taking each other to court. So we can see why, you know, in the first instance, Paul wrote this this type of a description of love to these people. They needed it. We need it. I need it. We all need it. Anyway, the main thing I think to see here, or one of the main things is to take away from this this morning, is this. Love isn't a feeling. It's not a nice, warm thing that happens inside. It's not mainly emotional at all. Love is behavioural. Love causes action. It causes a certain type of behaviour. It doesn't say, Paul doesn't say, love makes you feel good inside, like the world would tell you. Love is a thing that can come and go, and uh, you feel it some days, and you don't feel it the next. It's not about feeling it. Love is a choice. It's a behaviour. It's a pattern of life. Love makes you act good on the outside, not feel good so much on the inside. That's what love's about. Love makes your character change. Love, he says, it doesn't run away quickly. It endures. It doesn't run away quickly. Love endures. It is, he says it is patient. It means suffers long. It means long-suffering, patient. Love is patient. It means it puts up with a lot. That's the type of a, of a description that he opens there with. It endures injury without retali- retaliation. It overlooks offences. It is long-suffering. It is patient. It sticks around. It is also kind, he says next. Uh, it gives a lot. As, as it endures, it also is a given thing. It gives a lot. It endures a lot and it gives a lot. Love is generous in its nature. It isn't a greedy taker. It isn't a dominator or a manipulator. It doesn't do that. Love gives. It is kind. Just like God is patient and kind, God's children, because God is love and he's patient and kind, God's children, who are becoming more like him, will become more and more patient and kind in all their relationships. Love, he says then, he says, doesn't envy or boast or be arrogant. And there's sort of a similar type of pitfalls there, envy and boasting and arrogance. You could kind of put them together. Love doesn't boast or brag. It's not about me, me, me. It's not about building yourself up. It's not puffed up. It's not about me as such. One commentator said the idea here is that, and I quote, he says, those who express Christian love are not self-inflated windbags. That's the way he put it. Those who are are examples of Christian love are not self-inflated windbags full of their own nonsense and wind. Uh, We're not to be competing with each other or envying each other's gifts. Love doesn't envy. So we go back to the spiritual gifts. This is why it's in here because we shouldn't be looking at other people and competing against them and going, uh, they've got what I don't have and I'm jealous or I'm envious. And we're not to be bragging when we do have a gift that other people don't have. Again, love doesn't do that. This is why he's put it in here, because it sorts out the gifts and the attitudes in the church. We're not to be bragging or boasting about our gifting or about anything else that we've got from the Lord, really, in life. What do you have that you haven't received? What do you have that you haven't received from God? So love rules out competition, competitive attitudes that cause division in the body of Christ. Love builds up. Love is not rude. Love is not rude. This means uh, people who are loving people have a bit of manners, to put it simply. They behave themselves. It doesn't behave improperly towards other people. It doesn't step out of line and step on top. It, it is not rude. It is not disrespectful. It shows respect. Some men's arrogance is such to the extent that they've got a chip on both shoulders 
to such a level where there's an inappropriate, well, to use the biblical word, an inappropriate rudeness to the way they conduct themselves, inappropriate attitudes, inappropriate words, behavior, stem from not only a lack of wit or lack of maturity, but clearly a lack of love. Not only have you got much sense if you're that stuff, you're not very mature in Christ, but you just don't have a lot of love flowing in your life. This is not love. A Christian behaves properly towards other people, essentially. We have manners with each other. And some people can't help but rudely and overbearingly spout their opinion at every opportunity. They just have to get it out and get their point made, arrogantly assuming that their voice is needed to be heard and followed. This is not love. Sometimes love, for the sake of harmony, will sit quietly and have manners and not be rude. We don't need to correct the world in every conversation. Love is not rude. And then he says, love doesn't insist on its own way. It's kind of self-explanatory. I don't want to say too much. You may be entitled to something. You may be thinking this is the best way to do it. This is the way we really should do it and I want to do it. But love doesn't insist Love is able to forego. Love doesn't insist on having its own way all the time. Love, it goes on. Love is not irritable or easily angered. <clears throat> D.A. Carson said this. This is a commentator. He says, and I quote, Love is not easily angered. That is, it is not touchy with a blistering temper barely hidden beneath the surface of a respectable facade just waiting for an offence, real or imagined, at which to take offence. Love isn't irritable or easily angered. It's not like bubbling anger underneath. Love does not rejoice as we move on. We want to push through this. Love does not rejoice at wrongdoing. It rejoices with the truth. This is the type of thing that love does. It works in the proper attitudes to the proper occasion meaning that it doesn't hold grudges, it's quick to forgive, it keeps no record of wrongs and it can move on. It doesn't rejoice in wrongdoing. I mean, to rejoice in wrongdoing means, ha ha, I've got you now, I'm going to write it down and you're going to know about it forever. It doesn't rejoice at wrongdoing. It keeps no record of wrongs in that sense. Uh, Let me tell you now, if you've got grudges and unforgiveness in your heart towards anyone else in the church, drop it out of love. It doesn't rejoice in wrongdoing and move on. And it's not really for anyone's benefit, only for yours at the most deepest level. Because grudges and unforgiveness keep you on the hook. They keep you back. So we need to release that. Drop your attitude and drop even the sniff of an attitude. Because love wouldn't uh, give the impression, I'm just not happy with you and I'm going to let you know it every time I see you. I wouldn't do that. That's not a loving thing to do. So we need to not only forgive, but we need to move on and drop any sort of giving off a vibe to anyone else to make them feel uncomfortable in the church. Jesus wouldn't do that. The Holy Spirit is not uh, uh, leading you to walk that walk. And if you find yourself uh, tempted to convey your displeasure and and your attitude, just repent and leave it there. Keeps no record of wrongs. It doesn't delight in evil, but in the truth. We don't enjoy other people's problems. We don't enjoy dissecting other people's mistakes or failures. Love doesn't delight in talking about gossip, enjoying feeling superior because someone else has fallen. Like, I mean, our attitudes within get correctly aligned when God steps in. I mean, the Bible says elsewhere that Christians rejoice when those, with those who rejoice. And they weep with those who weep. I mean, the world sometimes weeps when they see people getting on and rejoicing. And they rejoice when they see people weeping. But the Christian's attitude is actually corrected. And and our emotions for other people, where they are at in life, we'll come alongside them and we'll uh, move appropriately alongside them. We rejoice with those who rejoice and we weep with those who weep. And love, what I'm trying to say is, it properly regulates our responses to problems and other people. Love bears all things, as I close this little portion, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. The meaning here, as I bring this to a close, like I say, there's nothing that love can't face. There's nothing, it bears all things. Uh, At the last bit it says it endures all things. There's nothing love can't handle. 
When God's in you and you're open to him and an attitude of love, you can conquer all things. It bears all. It endures all. It'll bring you through it all. It keeps going. It never fails. There's a relentless characteristic to love. It just keeps going. It never ends. The heart of love never stops beating. The heart of love in the Christian never stops beating. Uh, I want to really leave the two points there this morning and and get to the final point next week. And this week, I think, uh, as we've come face to face with this description, I think what the Lord would lead us to do is really have some time to let it sink in and to repent where we need to repent and rededicate our life and, and start again with our motives for Christian service and when we need to do that and just reassess ourselves in general. That's where I would want to let that sit this morning. I think it's such a powerful scripture that we, we don't do it justice to, to preach it and move on into something else and start talking about cessationism. I mean, this is an important portion. We want our lives to be counting for something, not for nothing. And we want to be people of love. So, as a close, I want to preach the gospel and I want to just give us some points as to how we might see this happen in our life as a final point. This must be a work of God in us. Look, don't go out try to work it up. This is not in us naturally. So we need the Holy Spirit to come and produce this supernatural fruit within us. We need the fruit of the Spirit. And we can help this process. I want to just say maybe one big thing. We can help this process by remembering the love of God towards us. As we're trying to live this love out, I think we need to receive God's love and see that often in the gospel. We need to apply the gospel to ourselves and see what we've come into the good of before we can actually dish it out with any power to anyone else. I think that's where the Holy Spirit's going to do his work within us. And uh, so it's not possible to actually read that description of love without thinking of the love of Jesus. I don't think it's... it's, At some point, if you study that long enough, you're going to come to the... Jesus. Jesus... Uh, is patient and kind. Jesus does not envy or boast. Jesus wasn't arrogant or rude. He never insisted on his own way. He bore all things. He endured all things for me. He went to the cross. This is all about Jesus. This is all about the gospel love of God. So this section defines gospel love. It's a description of Jesus' love for you, of the God of the gospel. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. And whosoever believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. So the, the gospel love of God is a giving love. It's an other orientated love. It's not orientated towards himself, but to other people. In fact, over the whole world. And I'm convinced, the point I'm making here is this, that the more we see Jesus in operation, the more we see his love and his life and his miracles and his healings, and the more we see him go to the cross for us, And the more we read about that in our own time, in our own quiet time, the more the Holy Spirit will produce a Christ-like loving character within us. We mustn't only read the epistles. We mustn't skip to the wee portions of Scripture where we like. We must be often in Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. That must form part of our reading. I mean, all Scripture is inspired by God and it's all profitable for teaching us. So... Let's not be people who just skip over the Gospels quickly. Let's spend time. If I could encourage you out of this message uh, to go somewhere in Scripture, I would say go to the Gospels. Read about the love of God towards you in Jesus. Listening to how, as you watch Jesus, who, who is God and God is love. So what you're doing is you're watching and you're listening to how love speaks when you listen to Jesus. You're watching how love operates in human situations. God is patient and kind towards us in the gospel and we want to see how he gave us what we don't deserve he was kind he was patient he gave us time and opportunity to repent i want to read titus to you listen to this when the goodness and loving kindness of god our savior appeared he saved us but the point i want to mark out is this the goodness and loving kindness of god our Saviour appeared, and it's a person. He is the goodness and kindness and love of God. And he appeared, and it says that he saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ, our Saviour, so that being justified by his grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. 
I mean, Jesus did not insist on his own way when he went to the cross. I mean, in the garden, we hear him pray, not my will, but thy will. He did it for you. He prayed that prayer of love for you because he's love in action and he doesn't insist on his own way. The love of Jesus was a type of love willing to forgive, to keep no record of wrongs. As they nailed him to the cross, as he done it for you, he said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. He's willing to forgive. In the gospel, in the love of God, God will wipe away every sin from your book. And he has done it if you're a Christian. He offers to keep no record of wrongs. This is gospel love. Jesus paid the full price for all your sins on the cross. And when you turned your back on sin, and when you put your faith in Christ as your saviour, what happened was this. You got full and free forgiveness because of the love of God. All your sins were wiped away. He paid the price to wipe every record clean. And for those who come to him in faith, that's what he does. He keeps no record of wrongs. And the point I'm laboring is this. Can you see that how whenever you see that often and understand what Jesus did for you, how that might free you up to be Jesus-like to other people? How when you've come into the benefit of a slate wiped clean, how you could wipe the slate clean for someone else? Because you've received it, you know what it's like. You've received that treatment from God. I believe the God of love is always enduring. That's the description of love. It endures. It doesn't give up. We may, deci- we may decide to repeatedly refuse it, but God keeps chasing after us. And we must be careful of hardening our hearts against this enduring divine love. So if you're not a Christian, God's love towards you is enduring love. God's love towards you is free. God wants to wipe your slate clean. God wants to forgive you for all the times where you haven't been what this scripture asks of you, to be a loving person. We've all failed, but Jesus lived the life of perfect love. And in the gospel, he says, I rang the bell that you couldn't ring. I fulfilled 1 Corinthians 13 for you. I lived that life of love. And I am willing to forgive all those who come to me in faith. You can't earn it. I earned heaven for you. You can't, you can't earn it. You can't work it up. But what you can do is you can admit you're wrong and you can come to me for free forgiveness. He saved us, not because of works of righteousness that we did. We just read it, but because of his mercy. So there's no pride or arrogance with God's love. It's a humble thing. And he was willing. This is how humble the love of God is as I close this morning. He was spat upon for you. He was willing to endure the mocking for you. He walked to the pillar and was scourged for you. He walked to Calvary and he gave his hands freely to the Roman soldiers and to the degrading abuse and he was stripped naked for you. That is humble love. That's a love that gives of itself. That's the type of love that God has for you. A love that knows no limits. A love that moves and searches you out. A love that doesn't give up on you. A love that allows itself to be stripped and spat upon. A love that allowed itself to be shamed. A love that humbled itself. A love that goes all the way. A love that dies for you even, so that you can be set free. This is the type of love that bears all things and endures all things. It moves, it achieves results. It's the love that saved you. And God's asking you in your life to replicate gospel love at the foundation of all you do. This is the love of God. Let's respond to it this morning. Otherwise, as Paul says, it's all for nothing. We love him because he first loved us. Amen.